I hope I have this microphone turned on. I've never used one of these before. Yes, you do. I've never used one of these before. I'm going to do my best to stay on stage so that the live stream can pick me up, but I tend to wander. I tend to get a little, a little moved around. Also, I need a little bit of time to set up. Everybody doing okay? Here's the thing. I'm just, I'm just a regular dude. I'm, I, this isn't going to be necessarily as refined a word as what you're used to on a Sunday morning. But it, it's, sometimes that's kind of what it takes. Sometimes it takes just, just a regular guy just coming and just kind of pouring what God's put in his heart. So we'll go from there. But um, I want to open a prayer, but, but the main thing I want to do in that is that I just want to lift up our pastor. Um, I mean, he's, he's got a lot on his shoulders. And so we just pray for a time of refreshing over him as he's on vacation and just, okay. But if you guys will join with me, we'll, we'll open up in prayer. But Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord God, we thank you, God, that you've given us so much that we can go on. You've, you've given us everything that we need to survive in today's world. And so we just thank you for the word. And God, we thank you for our pastor. We thank you for Angela and for their kids, Lord God. And we ask that you would be with them and you would pour your refreshing out on them, Lord God, that they would come back with vigor, they would come back with strength restored, Lord God, that they could, they could lead us in the vision that you've given them. Father God, so this church moves forward. God, that we're not stagnant, that we're not stuck in place, Father God, but that we're moving forward, we're making ground like you've called us to do. And God, I just ask for just an increased anointing today. God, the things I have to say aren't enough. God, the, the words that I've prepared aren't enough if you don't show up. So, God, I ask for you to be here, that you would bless us and that you would move in this place. Father, I ask for receptive hearts. I ask that you would begin to work in people's lives right now, that it wouldn't be my words, Father, that it would be your touch. It would be your spirit moving in this place. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, if you don't mind opening your Bibles to chapter 2, I didn't give any forenotice, so you're probably not going to get any, any words up on a screen. So hopefully you brought a Bible or a phone or something. But I'll give you a little bit of time to get to John chapter 2. Is everybody having a good week so far? It's the first day of it, so it can't be too bad, right? It's going pretty good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge this off of Larry. When I see Larry's there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know everybody else is there too. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with everybody. Okay. So we're going to start. It's chapter 2, and we're just going to read verses 1 through 10. And I'm probably just going to interject as I, as I feel led. Are we ready? Okay, so John chapter 2, verse 1 says, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, his mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And we'll pause there just for a little bit, and then we'll finish the rest of it. But do you feel like you missed something in that conversation? She says, hey, we're out of wine. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do about it? And, and then from there, from, from what Jesus said, she gets, okay, he's about to tell you to do something. You better do it. Where, where do we pick up on that? That's not, that's not necessarily what we read in, but we, the thing you have to remember, this is Jesus' mom, okay? She's been putting up with that woman talk for about 30 years now, okay? And granted, Jesus is perfect. There's nothing wrong in that. But so he, he gives a little bit of fun. Woman, why do you involve me? It's, it's not my problem. I wasn't supposed to bring the wine. What do you want me to do? Okay, but... But so somehow in that, she knows he's going to do something about it. And, and the cool thing is that after, one, after 30 years of, of being his mom, but also she had like nine months more experience with Jesus than everybody else, just saying, okay? That she knows a little bit more about Jesus' character than what we, we let on. See, because she knows everything there is to know about Jesus. So knowing that there's a problem, there's a need, there's something that has to get fixed. Think about everything that you know that Jesus has done. If he, was, if he was bringing sight to the blind, if he was putting hearing back in ears that had never worked before, if he was, if he was healing the lame, all Jesus did his whole life, everything that he did was he just fixed problems. 
which is, it kind of became appropriate because when he was born, he got to be raised by Joseph, who was a carpenter or a handyman. In those days, it wasn't just exclusive to wood. Anything that was broke, he had to learn how to fix it. And so that didn't just go in a physical sense of, oh, did you jiggle the handle? You know, stuff like that. It's, it's everything. It's, it's all the little problems that you have. And so Jesus, he, everything that he did was just to resolve a problem. So, you, I mean, like I said, if it was, if it was, somebody was blind, he gave them their sight. If there was leprosy, he cleansed it. If, if somebody was dead, he's like, nope, we're not doing that. And he'd raise them back to life. And that's what Jesus did. So, so, I mean, even say somebody just spontaneously had their ear removed with a sword or something like that. What did Jesus do about it? He fixed it. He put it back on because that's, that's Jesus' character. That's what he does. He just fixes stuff, okay? But so when he looks down on us and he sees that we're kind of cornered by an enemy who wants to steal and to kill and to destroy, what does Jesus do about it? He comes and he seeks out that which was lost. He comes and he saves it because that's who he is. He's here to fix what's wrong, okay? And that's just the depth of his character. That's just who he is, okay? So, so if we see that there's something separating us from God, something called sin, and he sees that disconnect, he sees that there's something wrong that we can't get to God because there's sin in our lives, what did Jesus do? He came to fix it. He came to get the sin out of the way. He came to become the way, the truth, and the life, the, tr the pathway to God. That's who he is. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus came to fix it. Whatever's wrong, he's here to fix it. Okay? So with that knowledge, with that understanding, when Mary says, we got no wine, and Jesus says, well, woman, what do you want me to do about it? He's going to fix it. I'm sure there was a little wink and a nod and, oh, mom. Don't worry about it, okay? So moving on, we're in chapter, chapter 2, verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Oh, we do have words up there. That's great. Fantastic news. I think you guys can read up here, too. Okay. Just a quick little side note in that. Jesus didn't prob probably didn't have a whole lot of experience with these servants. This could have been the first time that they ever met them, but they were really, really good wedding caterers. Because if you do the math, okay, Jesus says, hey, you see all those, those stone jars? Fill them up. And what does it say they did? It says they filled them to the brim. I think after about 120 gallons, I'm pretty, pretty sick of drawing water out of a well. Eh, that one's close enough. That's, there's some good servants there that when he says fill them up, they fill them to the brim. And you, I mean, if you do the math, that's 120 to 160 gallons of water. That's a lot of trips to the well, dude. That's bad. Okay? So carrying on, we're in verse 8. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. Oh, did you guys not know that? There's something you got to know about John's writing style. He loves to just spoil everything. Okay, if you didn't know that he was going to turn that water into wine, you do now. Okay? And that's kind of, kind of the fun way that, of how John writes is he's, he's just going to spoil everything right off the bat. The second Judas walks into the picture, he's just like, that's the guy. He's going to betray Jesus. Watch out. Like, he spoils everything. He's, he, I, I love John's writing style for that. But so as he, as he continues on, he's like, Psst, by the way, this is wine now. Okay? This is so, so the master of the banquet tasted the water that had turned into wine, and he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who dr had drawn the water knew. Of course they knew. They had to get all 160 gallons out of the well. They knew where it came from. Okay? They knew. Then he called to the, the bridegroom aside and said, everyone draws out their choice wine and brings it out first, and then the cheaper wine. And after the guests have had too much to drink, that, but you save the best wine for now. See, in, in those days, and especially in those big functions like that, 
if they didn't have quite enough, it, was, it wasn't uncommon for them to just kind of water it down a little bit. So, you know, if you've got five gallons of wine, we could probably, you know, add some water. Now we've got seven gallons of wine. Now we've got 10 gallons of wine. How is the quality of that wine? Probably not that great. Also, I have no experience in wine. I know nothing about wine. So when I say wine, I'm thinking like Welch's grape juice. That's, that's all I'm thinking. I grew up in a church where the attendance kind of fluctuated. And so, you know, the pastor could prepare for 100 people to show up for communion. And if 50 people showed up, you had 50 leftover communion cups. So you just find the, the whole youth group, and we're just standing in the back doing communion shots, you know? It's, oh, that's the good stuff. Oh. That's all I know of wine, okay? I, I don't know any of the other stuff. I went to a vineyard one time, and I drank a Coke. I just, that's just, that's just not me. I'm not, a, not really a wine guy. But so when it says that they, they, they usually watered the wine down, it wasn't necessarily the good stuff. I, I'm not going to get on the, the alcohol debate. I don't know. I don't know whether there was alcohol in it or not. I just, I just know Jesus made it. He made 160 gallons of it. Probably not alcohol, because that's a lot. A lot. Okay? But it says, it says they, he saved the best till now. Can you, they had to watch out, because as you watered the wine down just a little too much, at some point, people would start to notice. So you had to start off and, and give them the good stuff. And then you could add a little bit of water, and then you could add a little bit more because it's like, oh, we've, you know, you know, the first drink is always the, the best, you know, I mean, especially on the good grape juice. It clenches your jaws a little bit, and you just really feel it, you know. And that's grape juice. Imagine if I drink wine, okay? It's the good stuff, but it says he saved the best until now. But the interesting thing that I found about this is that Jesus took water, which is usually the thing that's wrong with the wine. Okay, if, if people have been in the habit of watering down their wine, and he takes the water, and he says, I'm going to make that the good stuff. He took the diluting agent. He took what was supposed to be weak and supposed to be the, the bad part of it, and he made it the good stuff. He made it the strong part. Okay? And so in an attempt to apply that to our lives, what did he do for us? He came to fix stuff, right? So when he up in heaven looks down and sees what Judaism had become, what the Pharisees had made that religion. He said, that's, that's not okay anymore. They'd watered it down. They'd watered down the religion to where it didn't look anything like what he called it to be. And so he came. Oh, I got to catch up to my notes. See, the, the nation of Israel had watered down their relationship with God so much, it, just, it was just rules and regulations. It wasn't anything special. It wasn't like they could, could go and meet with him and encounter him like they were supposed to. There was no fear. There was no reverence. It was just, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow these first six chapters of the Bible, and then, you know, everything should be good. And so it was, it, was, it was all for show. And the Pharisees would walk around, and they would look so holy, so holier than thou, but there was, there was hardly any good in them. And you can, you can kind of think about maybe, maybe the story of the Good Samaritan where were two devout Jews, a priest and a Levite, who were prominent members in the, in the temple, who had duties and responsibilities. They walk past a man bleeding in the street, and they do nothing about it. And, it's, and the responsibility falls on somebody else to fix it. Okay, and that wasn't an uncommon thing. That was, that was just what, what the religion had become. It had become so watered down that it wasn't about their relationship with God. It was just about how they looked. It was just about the outward appearance. And so now trying to put that in our lives, what did you used to look like? Before you got to encounter God, what, what was your life? It was just watered down. You were lost, you were hurt, you were broken, and he came and he brought life to that, right? Okay? Since Tammy's at the computer, I'll give her a little bit. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 9. And I'll give you just a little bit of time to get there. But, but think about the change that God has brought to your life. Think about what you used to be. And think about what he's calling you to be now. Okay? And here's the thing. This is, this is not a feel-good verse. It's just not. And so I'm going to preach it as quick as I can, and then we'll move on, okay? But so, so chapter 6, verse 9 reads, 
Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor those who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I'm going to pause right there. Good preaching, right? That's what we want to hear. Yeah, about all the, all the people who don't get to go to heaven, who don't get to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, look at, do you guys like that verse? You know why you don't like that verse? That's us. You ever been greedy, swindler? You ever been a drunkard? You ever, you ever gossip? You ever slander people? That's us. I'm not even going to touch on the, on the real, real nasty ones about the sexual immorality. That's, that's who we are. Okay? But the next verse makes it all worth it. Because Paul says, and that's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's the, that part will preach. Nobody wants to hear about, about hey, you, you know, these people don't get to go to heaven. But think about it. That's what some of you were. You don't get to hear about how people used to be a homosexual and now they're not because they had their, had their life changed by God. But he can do it. It's, it says so in the Bible, so it's real. And I believe that with all my heart, that he can take us and he can change us and he can make us into new wine. That he can make us not just the watered down things that we used to be, but he can take our weakness and he can make it his strength. Okay? So, looking at that, at that last verse one more time. But you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctified. That sounds like one of those Christianese words you get to hear all the time by the televangelist. Sanctified. Justified. Right? Okay? But so just, just to break it down so it's not a Christianese word, it just means to purify. Sanctified is to, to, to make it holy. And that's what God did in you. But the amazing thing is that it doesn't just happen once. You weren't just sanctified one time, okay? At the moment of your salvation, which you, with, at that point is, is, okay, and these are theological terms. I'm just going to read them, and we'll go on from there, okay? But it's called positional sanctification. That's your justification at salvation. When you accept Jesus into your life and you make him the Lord of your life, there you are sanctified, okay? From that point on, Jesus stands in your place, and God sees you as holy as he is. Okay, so if you have Jesus in your life, you're sanctified. Okay, you're doing great. Okay, and the next step, because it's a threefold process, is experiential sanctification, meaning it comes from experience. It's from the day-to-day -day walk. It's better known as spiritual maturity. The goal is Christ-likeness, the result of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and producing godliness in your life. It's realizing no, I skipped place. Okay. It's, it's what's going on. It's, in essence, it's you starting to look the way that Jesus already sees you. You start to conform to his image. You start to look like Jesus. You start to act like Jesus. You start to sound like Jesus. That's the process of sanctification. And if, if, if this were a race, okay, the positional sanctification at your salvation, that's the start of the race. Okay, and all of the race after that consists of just your day-to-day -day walk, how you live your life, how you run your race. And the finish line is ultimate sanctification. It's called glorification. It's the final stage in the salvation process, and it happens when you get to heaven. It's the future glorification of the believer. It's realized at the resurrection when the believer is transformed into the likeness of Jesus and presented to the Lord as holy and perfect. That's the finish line. That's the goal, right? But the, the key thing that I want to point out about those three things, one of those is the work of Jesus. It's your salvation. You're sanctified there. And then you do all the walking and you do all the work and you do all the running in the race. And at the finish line, he finishes it for you. Okay? Christianity today has, has kind of negated step two. Okay, so, so we start the race. And then we want to be at the finish line. And nobody cares about the race in between here and there. Because, well, 
God, Jesus is going to finish the work when I get to heaven. Why do I have to try so hard now? I don't have to look like a Christian right now. I'll look like a Christian in heaven. I don't have to act like a Christian now. Do I? My salvation doesn't hinge on how I act. I'm saved by grace. Okay? But should you look like a Christian if you're going to call yourself one? Seems like a yes to me. Okay? So, like I said, some of us want to skip step two. We just want to jump straight to the finish line. We just want to be perfect in all our ways. Does that happen in a day? Well, when Jesus does the work, it does. I think about the thief on the cross. The second that he, he submitted his life to God, Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. This had to be the shortest journey ever, okay? Because it was instant sanctification, died on a cross, and then he's in paradise, and he's made perfect with Jesus. We don't necessarily have the luxury of dying on a cross. Is it a luxury? Not so much, okay? But we have to work. We have to do stuff. And, and like I said, how I act isn't what saves me, okay? You, you have to understand. Grace tells me Jesus will do all the work. Grace says that I am saved, not how I act, okay? But... Grace tells me that Jesus will do all the work, and I'll be made perfect when I get to heaven. But my relationship with Jesus says that he deserves to see me try. Okay? And that's, that's the difference, where, where people think, okay, I prayed a prayer, I'm good. I can live any way I want to, sound any way I want to, walk any way I want to. But your relationship with God dictates that you should be trying. Okay? Think just in terms of Sorry. Okay, just think in terms of, of maybe a marriage. You are married to the perfect person, which I am. I'm doing great. Okay? Say you're married to the perfect person, and not just perfect in terms of looks, and she cooks great, and, and the house is always clean. Okay, but, but personality-wise, she's perfect too. Okay, or he. Okay, just, just imagine. Okay, so you're in the perfect relationship. You can do no wrong, right? I mean, because no matter what, she's always going to love you. She's always going to love me no matter how fat I get, no matter how much hair I lose, how rarely I shave. It doesn't matter, right? Because she's perfect. Okay, but Jesus is the same way. You're in a relationship with him. You're committed to him. And he's perfect in all his ways. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. Okay, but you ever see that odd couple walking down the street? where one of them like, looks like, you know, like Thor or some kind of supermodel, and then you've got like the uggo on his arm. Isn't that weird? It doesn't make any sense, right? But when you see two good-looking people walking down the street, oh, okay, that makes sense, okay? It's, it's true. I'm just saying you have, to, you have to want to match Jesus, okay? Am I ever going to be as good as he is? Nope. I mess up pretty much every day? Yep. Should I stop trying? Should I let my hair fall out and gain all kinds of weight so I look terrible? No. Okay? Because you want to match Jesus. You want to be the pure and spotless bride that he's called us to be. It's not about, it's not about the work. It's about the relationship. It's about showing that you're willing to work for it. It's about showing that you love him enough to, to change. Okay? while we're talking about marriage. See, because Jesus chose to do this, his first miracle at a marriage. He chose to do this first miracle at a wedding, and it really emphasizes the importance of marriage, okay? So just, just kind of side note, just a little extra. Value your marriage, okay? He chose to, he chose to work at a wedding. Okay, and I get some of you guys aren't married yet. I'm looking at the front row, and they're just like, I ain't married. I ain't ever getting married, okay? But if you are married, think about the importance of it, okay? And, and maybe even to try the water into wine metaphor. You know what? Your spouse may not be what you want them to be right now, but you have, you have never seen God in any part of Scripture discard his chosen people. Never. Okay? Even when they turned out to be water instead of wine, even in, when they stopped 
acting how they should act, he never discarded them. Okay, and that's his, that's his principle on marriage, that he's always going to value us. He's always going to love us that way. Okay? Um, I preached really quick. Uh, who's, who's doing altar call? Who's playing altar call? Fantastic. Okay. So just getting ready. Guys, I have, I've never preached longer than 20 minutes in my life. I hope you're okay with getting out of church early. Sorry. Okay. But the convenient thing with that is that just means we have that much more time for God to work in our lives and for God to move in the way that we need, to, need him to move. Okay? So when I get done talking and I shut up, then you can listen to what he has to say. But so think about it. If you want to be a fine wine, you want to be a pure and spotless bride, where does that process start? The moment of your salvation. Okay, if you're already saved, step one, done. You're doing great. Except now you've got every day for the rest of your life that you get to work and you get to walk in the grace of God. And you get to, you get to move forward. You're not stuck doing how you were. And the thing is, is you, ever, you ever met one of, a Christian? Oh, I'm a Christian. Like, you, you've known them like three, four years, and then, and then it just kind of comes out like, oh, yeah, I went to church on Sunday. And you're like, oh, really? I didn't, didn't strike me as the church type. And then get offended when you're like, oh, I didn't know you went to church. It's like, oh, yeah, I go to church every Sunday. Hell, yeah. You know, and you're like, what? Well, because cause you cussed that dude out like last week. And, and, and then when you got done with that, you went around and you gossiped about him for, for the week after that. And then when you left the parking lot, you peeled out and you flipped everybody off. And I'm, I'm just saying, you didn't really strike me as a Christian. And, and it hurts their feelings. It's like, if, but you have to, have to judge, what, is, what does the Bible say? You'll know them by their fruit. Okay? How can you expect Jesus to make you a fine wine if you're not bearing any fruit? Does that make sense? Okay? So, so you'll know them by their fruit. So all I have to ask, the, the only question I've got in this tonight, today, what time is it? Okay, the only question I have to ask, how are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Okay, and, and the main big question, you guys can begin to play. The, the big thing is just, are you trying? Or do you look the exact same way as when you got saved? Are you, are you making any progress? Are you working towards holiness? Because that's, that's what it's about. Christ calls us to be holy as He is holy. Meaning when He comes back for a pure spotless bride, He's going to look just as good as we do. And we're going to look just as good as He is. But I don't want Him to have to do all the work in my life. I want to try. I want to make progress. I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. I want, to, I want to look way better next year than I did last week, right? But it's a slow process. I've been going to the gym for like three months, and I still don't look like Captain America. It takes time. It takes, it takes the day-to-day -day devotion. It takes time spent with Him and His Word and in prayer. It's every day, right? And that doesn't sound very appealing, right? That You've got to work at something every day. No time off. But that's the life we're called to. We're called to be a church that actually looks like the church. We're, it's, think about what, what, the, what the, the, the master ceremony said about the wine. He says, you saved the best till now. Okay, and that, that verse always strikes me as, as a very similar verse to what Esther said. So that she was born for such a time as this, for the saving of many lives. Okay, so if we were born in this time, we were saved in this time, if we, if we are here in this moment, it's because we can do something in this moment. It's because we can be different in this moment. And I don't, I don't want the church held back based on habits. I don't want the church held back because of how they used to do things and that's what things are going to be the rest of their lives. I want the church to be the church. I, 
happen. And, and don't, don't get this as, as just all I'm doing is preaching negativity, okay? Because, I, I mean, I see us making amazing progress as a church. I mean, I, I really, really absolutely do. As, I mean, specifically in this church, okay? But as a whole, as the, as the entire body of Christ, I, I, think, we're, I think we're bound. I, th I think that there are things that are holding us back, and I think there are habits that have to be broken. It's, this isn't an original thought. This isn't something that I've just thought, but I've heard it, and I completely agree with it. Okay, is that there is a generation of the church that's been blinded by pornography, and they've been blinded by alcoholism, and they've been blinded by so many different things we don't get to be the church anymore because we're too busy bearing all this baggage. And yeah, Jesus will sanctify us when we get done with it. You know, and when we get to heaven, that won't be a problem anymore. But the world deserves to see a church that looks like the church now. Right? There's a generation of prophets, like I said, who are blinded by pornography. There's, there's a generation of teachers in the church that won't take the next step to, to really dive into the Word of God. I believe that we're there. I believe that this is the point where we step out and we do something different. That we make the change happen here. Okay? So, first step. You've heard me talk about how justification starts at the moment of your salvation. That's you. Okay? If you haven't experienced that yet, all I need from you is just to meet me down at the altars here in a little bit. Okay? And we'll pray through that and you'll start the race and you'll move on. But like Paul said, I want to run the good race. I want to fight the good fight. I want to finish strong. That was a guy with the audacity to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Meaning, this is the example you should look by. Look at my life. Can we do that? No. I don't want you guys to look like I do. I don't want you guys to act the way I act day to day. I want the church to be better than that. So we have to step forward. And the next thing after that is, is you hear me talk about sanctification, the day-to-day -day process. And this isn't just about your salvation. This is about leaving those old habits behind. This is about being made new. This is about getting rid of the dead weight, the things that, that trip you up in the race that we run. Okay? So just with every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm just going to start looking for hands. If you need... If you need an encounter with God, if it's your first time salvation, if it's just a brand new rededication that you mean, just raise your hand. Once you raise it, you can put it back down. I just want to linger in this moment for just a minute because I don't want anyone to miss it. I don't want anybody to miss the opportunity that they could be more than what they are now. And the next thing is, is I just want us all to come down to the altar. If you're, if you're physically unable, I understand you don't, have to, you don't have to fight just to get down here. But I just want us to pray for one another. I want the church to stand together and to be what the church is called to be, that we would, we would lift each other up, that we would bear one another's burdens. Okay, so the altar's, the altar's open. It's an open invitation to just come and, and, and get an encounter with God, that He would change your life forever, that He could move any way that He wants to. If you raised your hand earlier, just come find me. Come, come meet with me because I'd love to pray with you.